Well, good morning, church. So good to see everybody here today. I want to encourage you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Ephesians chapter 2 as we continue our journey through the book of Ephesians. This is our fourth part in this series. And last week we looked at um, the first 10 verses of chapter 2, which many believe to be one of the best biblical explanations regarding salvation. And uh, if you remember from last week, I know you do, that you know, we, were, we were dead in our sins and um, we were following the course of the world, but God, but God being rich in mercy and with his great love. He loved us so much that he sent us Jesus Christ, and even though we were dead in our sins, we've been made alive in Christ, so now let's, let's live in such a way to where we know that we're living in the identity we have in Christ. Ephesians is all about identity. How do you identify yourself? Who do you identify with? Are you in Christ? Are you not in Christ? The last part of chapter two for today kind of takes a little twist. And and as I'm studying this, I'm like, at first, I'm like, man, that's weird. Like, like, why is he talking about this? But then it made perfect sense. Because if in the first 10 verses, he's talking about the fact that every single person from every walk of life and every background has the ability and the opportunity to come to Christ. He knows that that means at times there's going to be a struggle between relationships. There's going to be a struggle with with people getting along. There's going to be a struggle with people being unified or not. In this last section in chapter 2, Paul addresses prejudices that impact relationships and we have prejudices all around us. This is nothing new, right? I mean, this has been around us. It's been the mindset since the beginning of time. The one that we probably see the most and even excuse the most is racial prejudice. That like some people, the, the opportunities they have or the lack of opportunities they have is based solely off of their race or the color of their skin. And that's wrong, obviously. We see that prejudice. There's also gender prejudice. Men, some men, look down on women as being lesser than. Some women, because they have, you know, been hurt so bad in other relationships with men, they don't respect any man because of that. There's there's gender prejudices. Now, we could say as Christians that we shouldn't be a prejudiced people, and I hope we all would agree with that, that we shouldn't be a prejudiced people. And Christians over the years has often been shown prejudice. I mean, there are people who have been killed for no other reason than because they claim to be a Christian. So we see prejudice all around us. And I think the passage we're going to look at today really addresses this idea of prejudice. Because when we start in verse 11 and we go all the way through the rest of chapter 2, Paul's going to give a clear explanation about relational struggles, and he's also going to address the call to reconciliation of why we should reconcile with one another. And this passage is going to prompt us toward the application. Now, let me say this about any time we study the word of God. We need to be very careful whenever we study God's word. I'm not saying that because God's word is like dangerous or something like that, but we need to be careful because it's so easy to not get the context. It's so easy to think that it's saying one thing and it's really not saying that. And so in order to be able to make the proper application of God's word, We have to do our very best to try to understand the author's intent to the original audience that he wrote to. So this period in time to the the people that made up the church in Ephesus. It's not just, oh, you know, what, what can I get out of that and how can I apply it? It's 
what was the author's intent to the original audience so that we can make the correct application in our life? And, and so please keep that in mind as we, as we look through these verses this morning. Ephesians chapter 2, let's see what the scripture has to say about reconciliation and unity. So if you would please, let's stand for the reading of God's word for today. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 11, down through the end of the chapter. He says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, that phrase is just like that but God moment. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. It might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Verse 17, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray. God, I come before you today, and Lord, as always, I, I, I ask that you would remove me from the situation, and that God, you would... Enable me to be able to speak the words that you want me to speak. And God, as you speak the truth of your word today, God, I pray that we can, that we can see that and we can understand it and we can apply it to our lives. And God, I pray that we as people who have been reconciled to you, that we would walk in a spirit of unity as this passage is going to teach us. So God, even through this passage if people need to be drawn to you, I pray that you would draw them to you today through the truth of the word of God. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. So, so far in this book, we've seen Paul expressing and talking about one's identity. And I don't know about you, but I like to remember it this way. It's so important to never forget who you are in Christ and whose you are. Because if you can remember who you are and whose you are, that's going to help you on those days where nothing's going right. That's going to help you on those days where you don't feel like getting out of bed. When you are reminded of who you are and of whose you are. So Paul goes from talking about these privileges and these blessings of having an identity in Christ to talking about the prayer of identity, to the beginning of chapter two, talking about this salvation that's only made possible in Jesus. And now he goes into addressing one group and the issue of reconciliation and how identity, our identity in Christ, should draw us together. And he's gonna remind the Gentiles of that in this particular text. Now, here's a truth that I hope that we can see from the text today. If you're taking notes, you can jot this down. You can fill it in if you grab the note sheet this morning. Biblical reconciliation leads to biblical unity. Biblical reconciliation leads to biblical unity, okay? Now, let me unpack that real quick before we break down the text in chapter 2. Biblical reconciliation leads to biblical unity. Here's what I mean by that. If you are depending on human reconciliation to get you to a biblical end goal of unity, it's not going to happen. If you take, if you try to twist the truths of God's word 
and think that you are going to get to the end goal of healthy unity, guess what? It's not going to happen. Only biblical reconciliation leads to biblical unity. So we have to understand what both of those things look like and what they mean. Therefore, those of us who have been reconciled, and I'm not even referencing right now reconciled to each other. I'm talking about reconciled to Christ. For those of us who have been reconciled by Christ, we should be the lead champions regarding a spirit of unity. Like for those of us who understand who we were before Christ, what Christ did, and who we are now, there should be nobody that champions unity more than people who are reconciled to Christ. Biblical reconciliation leads to biblical unity. Now in the church, not just Bridgepoint, but in the church, capital C Church, it's not a stretch to say that there's a great need for reconciliation and for unity. And let me say this. As long as there's people involved making up churches, there's always going to be a great need for reconciliation and unity. Okay? So let's see what scripture has to say about these things according to these verses in in Ephesians chapter 2. There's just two points today, okay? And I'm going to tell you up front, just so you don't get worried about how long we're going to be here, point number one is way longer than point number two. Okay, just so you know. Here's point number one. We are unified by reconciliation. We are unified by reconciliation. So so look real quick because this is a beautiful picture. According to this text, we move from being separated, verse 12, to being brought near, in verse 13, by Christ. Right? We were separated and now we're brought near. How did all of this take place? Well, let's start back in verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Can we just stop there and all agree that that's a very confusing verse? Like, what in the world? Like, Craig, can you explain that to us? No, not really. You know, don't really have much for you. Not going to go into great detail here, but do you see the first word in verse 11? Therefore. That points us back to the first 10 verses we just looked at in Ephesians chapter 2. Okay? That word is referencing what has just happened in the first 10 verses. What was Paul doing in the first 10 verses? He was addressing people who were dead in their sins, following the course of the world, who have now been made alive in Christ. So who is he addressing in this passage of scripture? Those who were unsaved, but they're now saved. They have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jews and Gentiles alike. He is addressing saved people in this verse. But he does particularly call out the Gentiles. He begins by addressing the Gentiles. He says, you Gentiles called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision. The point is this, that's a prejudice. He's pointing out a prejudice here. One group is thinking something about another group and calling them something that wasn't necessarily true. What's the argument that he's been making already all throughout the book of Ephesians? And even during our almost year-long study of the book of Acts, right? Right? He constantly is making the argument that you used to be separated not only from Christ but from each other. Like you used to be Jews and you used to be Gentiles, but now because of Christ, you are all being brought together as one. You all are being brought together in unity by what Jesus Christ has done for us. Everybody can come to Christ. Jews can come to Christ. Gentiles can come to Christ. Michigan fans can come to Christ. Ohio State fans, really, I mean, they can come to Christ too, right? Everybody can come to Christ. And might I say this? We better be very appreciative that Gentiles can come to Christ. We'll be in trouble. But here's what else he's saying here. 
He, he's reminding them that when you came to Christ, you didn't have to necessarily stop being a Gentile and start being a Jew in order to come to Christ. And he would tell the Jews the same thing, that you didn't have to stop being a Jew and begin to be a Gentile in order to come to Christ. All of you have been brought together as one by Christ. But there was still confusion. And it was impacting their human relationships. They needed reconciliation. What was the primary reason? Prejudice. Prejudice was the primary reason. He continues in verse 12. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, one thing I I can always appreciate about Paul is I love Paul's honesty. Like Paul, Paul didn't like, you know, he wasn't afraid to say something. He's like, hey, do you not remember Have you soon forgot? Have you already forgot who you were before Christ? He's going to call on them out on that. Like, who are you to think this way and talk this way about somebody else? Like, have you already forgotten who you were before Jesus? Now, don't we do that at times, if we're honest? Like, we'll say, oh, I can't believe that they would. But didn't that used to be us? Like, that's how we were. We were just like that. I, I, I don't understand why we expect people who are not in Christ to act like they are in Christ. It, it doesn't excuse their behavior. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying, why are we so mystified by people who don't live as if they are in Christ? So here's what people do. When there's, when there's a problem relationally, it's so easy to spend all of our time and all of our effort trying to fix that horizontal relationship. And I'm not saying that's a bad desire. I hope you have a desire to fix that relationship and not be like, ah, forget it. I don't care about that person. But here's what I think is important and what needs to be done instead. We spend so much time trying to fix our horizontal relationships when we fail to remember that most of our biggest problems is a vertical relationship. And you're never going to be able to fix that relationship horizontally until you get that relationship vertically correct. That relationship between us and Christ. He's reminding them that that your biggest problem is not even with the Jews. Your biggest problem is that you're still struggling in your relationship with God. He's reminding them that the reconciliation and the unity that they so desperately want, all of that is dependent upon our reconciliation and our unity with, in, and from God Almighty. And we can't have one without the other. Look at verse 12 again. According to verse 12, he is saying, and I'm so thankful once again, like last week, that he's referencing things in the past tense, right? He says, don't, don't, don't you forget, right? You were separated. You were alienated. You were strangers. Thank God they're past tense. But because of those three things, it resulted in the fact that they had no hope. They had no hope. And the first thing there, that you were at that time separated from Christ, I believe that's the most important one, and it directly impacts the other two. That you're separated from Christ. He's saying to these Gentiles, your problem wasn't the fact that you didn't understand the covenant of promise. He's saying your biggest problem wasn't the fact that that you weren't born a Jew. He's saying your biggest problem and everybody's biggest problem is when they are still separated from Christ. That's everybody's biggest issue. That's everybody's biggest problem. The biggest problem anyone could ever have is still being separated from Christ. I mean, when you look at this text in verse 11, you have these relational problems with one another, right? Can you imagine going to this church right now? And and you walk into this church, and I don't know, maybe they're having a church picnic, you know? And someone's like, all right, 
All of you who are circumcised, you sit over here. And all of you who are uncircumcised, you sit over there. And those of you who are circumcised, you get to eat first. I ain't never going back to that place, right? And so he understands that there are relational issues and problems taking place, verse 11. But he's also trying to stress that your relationship with somebody else pales in comparison to if you have a problem in your relationship vertically between you and God, which is found in verse 12. It's so much worse. But just like earlier in the chapter last week, right, dead in our sin, lost, but God being rich in mercy, same thing here in verse 13, but now in Christ. You know what he's saying with those words? Because you are in Christ, You shouldn't live your life that way anymore. This is how you're supposed to live your life. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Folks, this is the key verse in the entire section here. But now in Christ, everything changes. Everything changes for the better. Those who had been separated from Christ and separated from his people are now brought near to God, but it doesn't stop there, and to one another. So when you're brought near to God, you're also brought near to others who are what? Who are near to God. And we don't get to pick and choose who we are brought near to. Now, please understand in the verses that we have read and we will continue to read, the emphasis here is always on Jesus. It's always on what Jesus did. And and I said this a few weeks back, and and I mean it. I hope there is not one Sunday here at Bridgepoint Church where you leave here from a service and you're not thinking about one thing and one thing only. Man, Jesus loves me and Jesus died for me and I love Jesus and I want to serve Jesus and I want to follow Jesus. I don't want there to be one Sunday where anything takes the emphasis off of Christ. So let me read a few verses together, and I want you to focus on the fact that the emphasis is on Jesus and what Jesus Christ has done, beginning in verse 13 again. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. Everything is being done by and because of Jesus. Jesus is doing all of the work. The entire passage changes with that phrase at the end of verse 13. Having been brought near by the blood of Christ. Now what you're going to see here as we continue to read is that the emphasis in these verses is not on the ones who are being reconciled. The emphasis is on the one who is doing the reconciling. The emphasis is on Jesus. The emphasis is on Jesus who is bringing people together, okay? Christ makes all the difference. If you're going to leave here remembering anything from this message, please leave here knowing and living in the truth that Jesus Christ makes all the difference that you need. It's found in Christ. All day, every day, every way, it's Jesus. You think about it. Jesus is the only one who fulfilled the law. But now since we aren't under the law, but we're under grace, we can now have hope and peace made possible through who? Jesus. Made possible through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where we find our hope and our peace. The focus of reconciliation and unity is not on the ones being reconciled. It's on the one who does the reconciling. It's on Jesus. Look at verse 14 again with me, if you would, please, and I promise we're going to get through the rest of these verses. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. 
Now, now this is so important, and we're going to see this kind of reemphasized in the next verse also. Because when people think about unity, people think, all right, here's what God did. God took, you know, a bunch of people over here, and he took a bunch of people over here, and he brought them all together, and he said, get along, okay? Now, like, be unified. And, and, and I think that's an easy way to look at it, but I don't think it's the correct way to look at this, at least this particular passage of Scripture, Jesus is not saying, or Paul is not saying through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that, you know, Jesus brought a, a few Gentiles over here and he, and he brought a few, you know, a group of Jews over here and he brought everybody together and he just left them by themselves and said, go ahead and get along. Because chances are they're not going to go ahead and get along. Like, that's not how it works. So he's not doing it that way. What, what he's doing, I think a better way to look at this is this. What Jesus is saying is that I'm not bringing two groups of people together and putting them together and saying, get along. What Jesus is doing here is Jesus is saying, I'm bringing you Jews and I'm bringing you Gentiles and I'm not necessarily bringing you together. I'm bringing you each to me. That's what makes us all together. And so since you are in me, And since you are in me, be unified, be united, get along, (laughs) you know, be there for each other, encourage one another. And I think that's the more accurate way to look at it. He's not telling the Gentiles that if you come together with the Jews that that you're going to lose some of your Gentileness. And, you know, you Jews, if you come together, you're going to lose some of your Jewishness in the process. He's not saying that. He's saying, I'm going to take you and everything that you are, and I'm going to take you and everything that you are, and I'm going to bring you together in me, and together we are all going to be united in Christ. We're going to be unified. We're going to get along. We're going to support each other. We're going to help each other. We're going to pray for each other. Whatever that looks like. And what's the result? He says, because Jesus did it this way, what was torn down? What was broken down? The wall of hostility. Because Jesus did it this way, there's no longer any wall of hostility. So if there does happen to be any walls of hostility, what's the answer to that? We've built them. We've constructed them. Because he's already torn them down. He's already broke them down. Let's keep reading verse 15. This is how he did it. By abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. Here's what I think he's saying. You are unified because you've been reconciled by Christ. Because you've been reconciled by Christ, if you've said yes to Christ, then you are unified, so live as if you have been unified. I I just want you to understand that there's nothing wrong with having the desire to reconcile with one another, but you cannot reconcile with one another before you reconcile with God. You've got to get the order correct. Because if you're not reconciled with God, you can't possibly reconcile with somebody else. You have to understand the proper order. God has torn down the wall of hostility. So I say, let's leave it torn down. Don't rebuild it. In whatever situation that might even be popping into your head right now. Verse 17, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off. Do you already forget that you were far off? And peace to those who were also near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. I hope you don't think that we are smart enough or created enough to come up with some creative way to be reconciled to God. Like, that's not our doing. It was done by Christ. 
It was accomplished by Jesus. Jesus is the one who did all of the work. So as a result then, because you've been reconciled with Christ, what's the result? Live in unity with each other. Be unified with each other. I I, I wanna give you three quick applications, if I can, for reconciliation that I really think will help us set the stage. And I was gonna ask for permission but you guys know, even if you said no, I was still going to do it. So let's just do it, okay? Because we got a few more verses that we need to get through today. Let me give you three quick applications to help with reconciliation. Number one, lose the secondary identity. Put it in its right place. What could possibly be our secondary identity? Any way that we identify ourselves other than in Christ. In Christ is the only way we should identify ourselves. So if we are identifying ourselves in any other thing, that's a secondary identity, and we need to put it in its place. Now, we look at this you know, situation, and you're like, but Craig, but Craig, you don't know my background. I don't. You don't know what I've done. Maybe I don't. You don't know how much I've sinned. You don't know how much I've sinned. Let me say this as nicely as possible, but to still get my point across. I don't really care who you were before Christ. I'm more concerned as to who you are now that you identify with Christ. That's my concern. So let's stop using the art. But Craig, you don't know. Nobody does, but God, but now in Christ. I I think we just, I don't know this for sure, but it's so easy to use that as a crutch to not really need to do what we need to do with our lives moving forward. But you don't know what I've done. No, but I know God is rich in mercy like we talked about last week. Now, when I say I don't really care, that doesn't mean I don't care. What I'm saying is I don't really care who you were before you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter. Why? Because that person no longer exists. But the person you are now in Christ is the only person that matters. Lose the secondary identity. Here's another point of application. Don't add anything to salvation. This could be the clearest application in this text. Don't be like, and we talked about this in Acts, right? Don't be like the Jews, be like, hey, you know what? You can come to Christ and be circumcised, right? Hey, put your faith in Jesus Christ and be baptized. And I'm not downplaying the importance of baptism. In fact, we're going to celebrate three people here in a little bit who are taking the step of obedience in baptism. But don't add anything to salvation. Because here's what happens. When you add stuff, you mess up the process of reconciliation, which messes up the process of everything else. So don't add anything to salvation. And then here's a third quick application. Let the wall of hostility, in the notes I said be destroyed, let it remain destroyed between one another, but also between those of us and other people who are not like us or who we struggle with getting along with or understanding the way that they choose to live their life. What I mean by that is this. For those of us who have been shown grace, it's wrong to not be gracious. For those of us who have been shown mercy... It's wrong to not be merciful. For those of us who have been forgiven, it's wrong to not forgive. I'm not saying that that's a process like this, an overnight process. Yep, that's what I'm supposed to do. I don't even really know how I'm going to do it, but let's just do it. But it's still a process that we should be working towards. If we have been reconciled, then we should be agents of reconciliation. And if we aren't, 
then it's wrong. I'm so glad that this isn't a topical message, but it's just the next text up in our study of the book of Ephesians. Therefore, you can't get mad at me. We're just, we're just preaching the Bible. We're just telling you what the Word of God says, which is hard to hear at times, is it not? It's hard. So here's the second and last point. And let me remind you, for those of you who are still worried about how long you're going to be here, the second point is a lot shorter, okay? Here's number two. We are reconciled to be unified. Now, some of you are like, wait a minute, bro. Wasn't that point one? No, no, no. Point, no, point number one was we are unified by reconciliation. This point says we are reconciled to be unified. So positionally, we have been reconciled. Therefore, let's be unified. Let's have a spirit of unity. Since we've been reconciled to Christ, let's go practice unity. Let's go be united. Look at verse 18. For for through him... We both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you who are no longer, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm no longer a stranger. But I'm really glad I'm no longer an alien, right? Now, for those of you who are really concerned, no, that's not what he's really referencing here in these verses, We're no longer strangers. We're no longer on the outside looking in. We're no longer thinking and feeling that we don't belong to the family of God because we are a part of the family of God when we accept what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And so he's saying that you're not strangers, that you belong. You're connected to the family of God. You're connected to to God. We're all part of the family. And that got me thinking. I'm like, man, because I think about so many people in the Bible, and I think of the Apostle Paul, who, who wrote the book of Ephesians amongst other books, and I'm like, man, like, Paul is just the man. Like, Paul is just awesome. And then I think of people like the Apostle John. Can you imagine being the person who self-proclaimed the one whom Jesus loved, right? Can you imagine being the person Standing at the foot of the cross, and Jesus gets eye contact with you and says, Take care of my mama. That, that's, that's relational. Like, I think of John, I'm, I'm blown away. I think of Peter. I'm well aware that Peter said some of the dumbest things ever recorded in Scripture, but Peter also walked on water. And I think about them. And then I think about those verses and how we are all fellow citizens. Check it out. Paul, Peter, John, Craig. (laughs) Like, in my mind, I'm like, that doesn't work. But that's exactly what that verse says. That we are all part of the same family. That we, all, we are all the, the same citizens with the saints. And check this out. When I get to heaven, I don't have to sit at the little kid's table just because I didn't author a book of the Bible. Y'all know how you do it at Thanksgiving. But I'm sitting there and I'm fellowshipping with and I'm locking arms and I'm having conversations with some of the greatest people who ever walked the face of this planet for Christ. Why? Because I'm no longer a stranger. I'm no longer an alien. I'm a fellow citizen with the saints and I'm the same members of the household of God. How? By Jesus. By Jesus. Let's finish up. A couple more verses. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Oh, what a family tree that is for those in Christ. (laughs) Verse 21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. 
In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And folks, that requires unity. We see reconciliation that leads to unity and we should be unified. So let's go be unified in Christ. And even when you're unified in Christ, that doesn't mean that you're always going to agree with everybody else. But it does mean that you're always going to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's the fact that people need Jesus. And if we've been reconciled by Jesus, then we should be doing everything in our power to help other people be reconciled in Jesus. And since we've been reconciled to Christ, if we are not reconciled to others who are in Christ, my question is why? Why? Because that does not help the body of Christ. When people who are in Christ are not reconciled and unified with each other. So I leave you with this question. Are you helping the body of Christ be unified? Are you helping the body of Christ be unified? Would you pray with me? God, thank you for today. Thank you for the truth of the word of God in this particular next section of the text that we've looked at. And God, I pray that we could continue to understand the things we need to understand about reconciliation, about unity. And God, help us, God, because I'm well aware, I'm well aware that there are so many people in here who are in the middle of situations that that just hurt, and they're struggling with, and they've been hurt, and they've been wounded. And God, we look at these verses and and, and we see and we're reminded of how we need, because we're reconciled in Christ, we need to be reconciled with one another. And God, it's hard. So God, I pray that you would show up in a real way in the people's hearts and lives who really need some help and some guidance when it comes to this particular area. And God, I pray that every single one of us who have been reconciled by Christ, I pray that we would all consider being truthful and answering that question, are we helping to bring unity to the body of Christ? And I pray that we can answer, yes, we are. So God, continue to speak to us and work through us in the rest of our service today. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. I want to invite you to stand if you would please. And as we get ready for baptism, we're going to sing this final song. And as we sing this final song, we we love to give people the opportunity to respond to the Holy Spirit immediately as he's he's tugging on your heart. So you come if you need to. If not, just sing out this incredible.